Well, Gabby, welcome back to the show. Always great to visit with you. Thanks for having me, Cable. It's good to talk to you even post SEI. That was a lot yeah, of fun. Absolutely. Uh, congrats on your recent appearance on Fox. That's crazy. So, yeah. Talk a little bit about that. What did they have you on to discuss? I talked about environmental stuff, but I felt it was an opportunity to plug in hunting as conservation because TikTok has been unsurprisingly suppressing different types of content. We hear from friends. I don't use TikTok personally because I know that I would be censored and I, yeah. I'm not comfortable using it. But from friends who engage on the platform, who hunt fish or shoot guns, it's the most censorous of all the media platforms out there. Mm -hmm. And I've seen gun content banned and I know what practices they kind of rely on. And I wanted to plug in the fact that obviously they changed their climate policies to suppress or rather to kind of restrict content they deem misleading. So I made the connection that, okay, they talk about sustainability. Are they going to consider hunting sustainable? Are they going to restrict content like that? Why are they restricting gun content, which is arguably, I think, at least 60% of what funds conservation funding under Pittman Robertson. Right. So I felt it was a good opportunity to plug in hunting on the national stage. So I think they were appreciative of that. And I think the guests were like, or the hosts were like, whoa, mm -hmm. that's a unique angle. So I hope um, people liked that tidbit. And I recently spoke to Fox News Digital with uh, Safari Club, Sportsman's Alliance, and a few others mm -hmm. about the lead shot ban, which you've talked about at length. But I, I put that idea into the head of the reporter. And I was like, you should cover this because there are many attacks on hunting. I hope he follows up with some topics we're going to talk about today on yeah. uh, the forest service closures, but it seems like the hunting politics angle is starting to get more exposure in national media. So any way that, whether it's me, you, or anyone else who has the ability to put this perspective out there, we have to do that. And I felt very compelled with the Fox appearances recently to do that uh, digital or on TV. Well, hopefully the first of many, uh, yes. thanks for representing us and, and hopefully, well, <laughs> hopefully living it was in, well. <laughs> uh, reality, right? I mean, yes. That's where we exist as uh, hunters and conservationists. And the funding mechanism is something that the left never wants to account for. Like, okay, we yeah. want to do away with hunting and fishing. Well, who's going to pay for it then? And they don't have an answer. It's just crickets. No, no and so. I think I sent to you and Ryan when that article on the lead shot ban uh, came out from Fox News. Mm -hmm. These so-called biologists, and not every biologist is designed the same way because there are lots of wildlife biologists who don't believe in wholesale lead bans or they don't dismiss hunting as an integral part of conservation. They were telling me that, well, hunters may fund it, but they have little involvement elsewhere. And I'm like, do you live under a rock? <laughs> right. Because like we're, we're involved. I mean, I don't have direct so-called direct involvement. I do give some money. I buy licenses. I wish I could be more involved, but at least nominally I'm involved. And there are many, many people, many groups out there that are far more involved than me, personally mm -hmm. speaking, um, different organizations. You can't dismiss the efforts of RMEF, Safari Club, Ducks Unlimited, all these different groups that put their money where their mouth is privately raise a lot of money to help with habitat, to help with wetlands conservation so much. And, and for this biologist, so to speak, to be dismissive of it, just to say we're only part of the funding mechanism, but nowhere else, they completely underestimate, you know, the, the fact that all these species were recovered because of hunter contributions, because 100%. of anglers uh, yeah. for the Dingle Johnson component as well. So, and, and, and I was going to refute back. I was like, ah, I, I responded once. I don't want to give the guy more attention. But if, if hunters are not part of the landscape or they're a small integral part of this, how come NPR in 2018 said without hunters, conservation goes extinct? NPR mm -hmm. is not a friendly source to hunters, generally no. speaking. And so my understanding is if they understood it, how come this biologist didn't? Yeah. Well, I mean, all you have to do is look at Europe where yeah. wildlife is completely privatized mm -hmm. and hunting has been, it is now limited to the uber- upper crust like mm -hmm. of society and it takes place on private land and that's essentially it you know i mean is that is that what we want because if they had their way that's where we would end up certainly so, yeah um so okay we have a bunch of other stuff to get into today let's start with the left's reaction to the latest mass shooting that one hit pretty close to home for me because i mean like i'm wearing a pair of adidas running shoes right now that i purchased at that outlet mall Right. It's literally now like in Texas. 10 minutes from my house. Um, we shop for the kids there all the time for, for something like that to happen basically in your own backyard. It, you know, it's a tragedy. It puts it into perspective that it can happen anywhere. Mm -hmm. But um, no one wants to talk about the real issue. I mean, just today. Uh, I mean, these people's bodies are not even cold yet. And President Jackass is tweeting out 
Once again, Congress must send me a bill banning assault weapons and high-capacity magazines, enacting universal background checks requiring safe storage, and ending immunity for gun manufacturers. I will sign it immediately. We need nothing less to keep our streets safe. It's weird that he talks about streets there because they don't give a damn about the violence going on in the streets of every blue major city in America. I mean, you defund the police, crime goes up, homicides, gun-related homicides go up, and because there's not more than one victim in a lot of the cases, it's not a mass shooting, and they don't care. They just pretend like it doesn't exist. And, it, and I get it, especially when innocent children get killed in these mass shootings, that pulls at people's heartstrings. But the statistics prove mass shootings are a drop in the bucket when it comes to overall gun-related homicide in our country. Um, and they also skew those stats because they throw in gun-related deaths. Well, suicides are a lot of that, but that's just one person. And, you know. um, but the, the real issue, and I was doing some research on mental health, in 1950, and I understand they probably committed more people to psych wards back then than they probably should have, right? But we had half of the population of what we have 330 million people now. We had half of that then, and we had 500,000 people in psych wards. Today, statistics prove that mental health has degraded to the point where one in five teenagers uh, claim they have some sort of mental issue that they're struggling with, whether that's depression. And it's like one in 10 adults. So we've had this plague, and I believe it's because of the degradation of society, like normalizing stuff like drag shows for children or taking God out of schools. Whether you believe in God or not, if you were to look at the Bible and say, this is a good way to at least live, love your neighbor as yourself. Let's just say that, right? Like, okay, there's some really good information in there that would probably make everyone a better per person. And you take all this stuff away and you, you take away the, uh, you know, the family unit of uh, having an actual father figure in the house, um, and you're left with a mental health pandemic. This isn't going to fix anything. Saying taking, disarming the law-abiding citizens will fix nothing. Criminals, mentally ill people are going to get guns, and they're going to do unspeakable things with them. That's really true, and I think you explained the situation well. And I was listening to your governor, Greg Abbott, yesterday on Fox News Sunday, and he actually pointed out something very interesting going back to the rise of crime. Crime is coming to places that were, were historically safe, mm -hmm. places that are known and notorious for having rampant crime. And this is not a red or blue issue. It's largely because of a lack of, you know, lack of discipline, lack of enforcement of penalties against harsh criminals. And this is coming to states regardless of the types of gun laws that they have. Yeah. And as we know, and your listeners know, introducing more gun control doesn't stop potential would-be mass shooters. It, it yeah. largely is underpinned on what are they feeling mentally? Um, can these people be spotted out? And I wouldn't say a red flag law would be the antidote. They rush to that too because they, they think, oh, this is going to be the foolproof remedy. But there are a lot of Fourth Amendment concerns with a blanket red flag law that's also obtained. And I'm still waiting on information from the Allen, Texas shooting. What type of a weapon was used? Do we know? Do you know if it's, I haven't heard if it's an AR-15 or a handgun. Um, and the person no, was 33 it, it years was old. It was not a, it wasn't a handgun. So it was it an AR-15. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. Thank I God mean, but, for the police officer that. Yes. Yeah, unlike that the ones in Uvalde that yeah. were told to stand down, this guy was like, well, screw that. I'm engaging this guy. And mm -hmm. like, he put him down very quickly and it still shot a lot of people, but. If that, right. if that officer wouldn't have been there to neutralize that threat, I mean, goodness gracious, mm -hmm. this could have been even worse, which it's already terrible. But Yeah, but we also have to look into the policy of the outlet mall. I think some individuals had pointed out that it was a gun-free zone. Um, mm -hmm. Even with the passage of constitutional carry in Texas, certain localities or rather locations can still institute gun bans privately. So did the gun-free zone, if, we're pre if we presume it to be a gun-free zone, did it invite this type of crime? Did the guy look to be, why was he targeting this? It's, it's evil to target any situation, any location. Hmm. But why did he specifically rule out this place? I think he may have a manifesto. They say that he may have some neo nazi Well, if views. we see it is the question because right. the trans person that shot up the, the Christian school recently mm -hmm. had a manifesto, and we still have not seen it as the public. Right. And there's a reason for that because they don't want to say, oh, she was targeting Christian kids, mm -hmm. right? I mean, like, that's, and we'll see what this, and 
I don't even know what uh, ethnicity this person was. Um, I don't, you know, we're recording this. It's going to air this weekend by, by this weekend. Maybe we'll know his name and his ethnicity. His name is already revealed. Okay. The problem with fellow journalists, I really do hate this. Um, don't give like license to the name. I think we still have a problem of showing the picture and showing the name. And that invites, I think, cop copycats and, and people are still perpetuating this. Um, and, and that's a mistake because we have to learn from, from this that you don't want to do that to elevate copycats. And I don't know why all the media is still continuing to do that. I understand for law, uh, law enforcement purposes, they need to identify the suspect. But I think we're straying away from it because media people, unfortunately, I, I wouldn't say they look forward to these type of events, but they anticipate these events and say, okay, when can we jump on this? When can we say, okay, let's look at the weapon. Um, when can we push gun control? Never They're waste a good tragedy. Which is horrible. I hate. Uh -huh. I hate when anyone you know puts politics to these horrific events. That this first should be a time for healing. Figuring out what the motivation of this person was, why they were doing this. We can assess the weapon, of course, but even if it is an AR-15, in the grand scheme of things, when you look at the crime statistics, it's still handguns overwhelmingly that are used in mass shooting events. And this was a mass shooting event in terms of the numbers. It was four or more victims. Uh, sometimes it's different kind of methodology relating to it, uh, whether it's for injured or for injured or deceased. And a lot of people rush to kind of conclusions as to how a mass shooting is defined. But by all traditional or conventional characterizations, this is a mass shooting event, of course. And we're going to see stuff come out. And um, I think, like I said, the, the typical playbook is going to follow. Biden, of, of course, is rushing to push gun control. Uh, revoking immunity is not going to stop this because gun manufacturers have no culpability in this evil person's actions. Mm -hmm. um, they are held to account liability wise for several factors, five or six conditions. So they're not totally immune. Other industries that are far more powerful are immune. So to scapegoat entire industries for people who abuse their products is not feasible. And it's Heck, somebody ran it's over terrible. seven people in South Texas yesterday. Mm -hmm. Are they going to hold the, the manufacturers accountable? Vehicle no. manufacturer. Yeah. I mean, that's it's absurd. Uh, the person accountable is the one pulling the trigger or the one driving the bus or van exactly. or whatever it is. It's Universal background checks wouldn't have any change on this. We have background checks in place and we have people who were, who handle the NIC system who overlook certain people who are questionable or who sh should be prohibited possessors. We also have to ask, I would ask this as a journalist, did this person have a previous criminal record? Was he prohibited from owning guns in the course of this event, in the course leading up to him enacting terror in this manner? Was he a prohibited possessor? Most likely he probably was, but right. I would like to see the evidence, you know, confirming or substantiating that claim, but he probably wasn't just a first time offender. I suspect someone like this probably had to compete, uh, commit crimes rather repeatedly. Um, why would someone do this random? Um, usually criminals are repeat offenders. So I, I, I suspect, and, and want to obviously wait to confirm, but I have a suspicion he probably was not a first time offender. I think he probably had a an illustrious criminal record. A lot of these mass shooters have. Um, some of them have been first time offenders, but a lot of them tend to have previous criminal records, uh, much like the shooter outside of Houston. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll continue to uh, keep our, our finger on the pulse of that. Luckily, we control Congress. And so it's, it's dead on it's, arrival. Yeah, it's gun not control. Um, switching gears a little bit, but mm, not really because it's still an underhanded assault on the Second Amendment. Uh, they're considering closing 100,000 acres of federal land to recreational shooters, and I believe it's mostly in Colorado. Mm -hmm. um, they're not going to close it to hikers, bird watchers, campers, anglers, granola-eating hippies. They're just not going to do it, but they're going to close it to anyone that wants to shoot a gun there. The problem is that I own that land, and you own that land, um, so it's clearly a target. It's targeting the Second Amendment, and and gun owners, um, it's a slippery slope too, because, and we'll talk about, you know, the, the incremental closures and how the, you know, once you take something away, you don't very, very rarely do you ever get it back. And then instead it's the other way. It's like, well, what else can we take away? And the next thing for me, it's very clear be like hunting and trapping. Well, we did away with recreational shooting. Hooray. What can we do now? That's a good encapsulation of the rule. And I think generally speaking, before I speak to this prospective rule proposal directly, this is how incremental bans are devised. This is mm -hmm. their thinking. 
they say, well, we have to recognize a problem. They claim, and this is not just a new law. This has been kind of dabbled with since 2013. And I'm reading directly from kind of a, a guiding document that said that um, the reasons for the ban, they attribute it to three reasons, residential housing density, high use recreation areas on national forest service and other governmental lands and existing conflicts between recreational shooting and other uses on NFS and other governmental lands. If it really is about safety and residential density, I don't know, you know, maybe I'd have a different opinion, but I think that was, those are just reasons drawn out of a hat at random. Yeah. Well, it's a hundred thousand acres. This? That's yeah. like my dear lease is 4,000 acres. Right. There's not a place on there where you can't safely shoot a rifle if you know, right, you know, right. if you're pointing it in direction, you're like, okay, this is safe. I know nobody's over there or there's a big hill right here that I'm shooting into. It's ridiculous. It absolutely is. Acres. Yeah. And I think it would go against Dingle Johnson and Pittman Robertson. And they're saying, well, under, you know, those existing laws, we actually do have a reason to ban these type of opportunities. And I would think defenders of both of these seminal conservation laws would look and say, there is nothing in either of these laws that permits you to close target shooting. And they mm -hmm. say, well, there'll be exemption. There will be exemptions for hunting. I don't believe that. I, and then how many other car routes are they going to give? And they are debating between whether or not to make this a permanent closure or a temporary closure. How can we hold them to it if it's a temporary closure? And why wouldn't it give way to a permanent closure? I right. think they're going to err on a permanent closure side. And Colorado is becoming increasingly difficult to do hunting and certain other activities it's gun control has passed in the state what they've done to that state that it, it's just it used to be it used to be the west like yeah like wyoming west, and montana with western values and like pro gun pro hunting and it is it colorado has changed so much and you know denver and boulder are a lot of the reason for that and they're still in rural colorado i mean they're the ones that are going to be affected they're the ones that voted against wolf reintroduction. Mm -hmm. They're the ones whose pets and livestock are actually going to be eaten because the people in Boulder and Denver don't have any understanding of what scientific wildlife management really is. They're like, yay, wolves. They're never going to see a wolf. They're going to sit in their cubicle or in their uh, you know, apartment, and maybe they're working from home, but they're not going to ever be in a situation where wolves are going to affect them. But yeah, yeah Colorado it's a shame. residents. Yeah, Colorado shooters and hunters are being attacked on all sides at the state level from Denver and then also coming from the federal side too. They can't catch a break. And it's very disappointing because when you have attacks coming from both of those levels, what is to say that's not going to happen and transpire in other states? We see this in Washington state happening with the bear hunt, mm -hmm. um, with a redesigning, a reimagining of wildlife agencies. But back to this rule specifically, we have seen this type of prohibitions under the guise of protecting or preservation before. This has happened in other areas. I want to point to the case study. I think I referenced it on your podcast before, but if not, I'm happy to talk about it here. California put a similar proposal to protect marine life areas off of California's coast from Santa Barbara to San Diego under the guise of stopping overfishing, protecting mm -hmm. coral reefs, and making sure that certain fish species are not fished out to extirpation. The American Sport Fishing Association, which runs Keep America Fishing, they're a great outlet. They have worked alongside the shooting sports interests to stop lead ban prohibitions uh, because it affects lead, lead tackle too. So on this side on um, marine protection areas, they have pointed specifically to these closures and said they were proposed as a good faith effort to restore you know, imperiled species, protect areas, but recreational anglers never got that access back. And I remember this because this is one of the first political issues that really animated me to start covering this as a journalist, because I found out that I won't be able to go offshore fishing in California in these really nice areas close to the shore. Like, why is that? It didn't make sense to me. So this is an issue that animated me first. And, and I saw that and I, I read, you know, ASA and, and what they were saying. And to me, there's so many parallels to this proposal, to the lead prohibitions, to the 60 million acres closing in Alaska. And they have, this was in 2015, 2016. They stayed I had the ASA on recently when they were talking about these, uh, there's like, I don't know, 50 of this one kind of whale that mm -hmm. exists along the uh, Atlantic coast. Yeah, and, the North Atlantic right whale. I've been talking about that yeah. too, if you want to talk about that as well. Uh -huh. So and, and they're, like, they're hurting we have to, commercial and recreational anglers. From, yeah. from Florida to that Jersey, rule. we have to say that you can't go over X knots per Yes, on the vessel rule. Because you might hit one of these whales. Like, And there's no science. Like, one of those whales gets hit like every 10 years, you know, and it's just like, but, but we have to, we have to take a shot at commercial fishing and recreational. Uh, yeah. And because we have to protect these whales that 
do, we, do they really need protection or are they struggling for some other reason which for is offshore wind actually yeah. if we're being honest here yeah. they, they they care about the whales to stop recreational and commercial fishing and even commuting by boat um those new england areas a lot of people commute by vessels and this vessel rule it limits like according to your listeners probably heard it by the size for up to six months of the year and so it's it, they, those areas become no-go zones, much like with this marine protection area. That area has essentially become a no-go zone for recreational anglers, mm. and you can't fish there, and you lose that access, and you never gain it back because of those who steward California natural resources. They're preservationists. They're not uh, in support of you know recreational angling very much. They don't like hunting, but um, the wildlife agency is in a pickle. They've been trying to do these recruitment efforts to say, see, we have hunting opportunities after so many years of neglecting it. And I will say they weren't probably the best at communicating it because I never knew about hunting when I grew up in California. Not saying I couldn't do it, but they didn't advertise it as much. Fishing was very easy to advertise, mm -hmm. but they kind of, you know, shot themselves in the foot here, metaphorically speaking, by neglecting this area. Now they're having to kind of recoup for it and, re and compensate for it. And, and they have people at the helm of their agency who don't represent our interests. But going back to this Forest Service rule, I put this case study in California out there for your listeners because, and similarly with the vessel rule, creating no-go zones, they claim to be for public waters and public lands access, and they're proposing all these crazy rules. Uh, similarly, I've talked to you offhand about 30 by 30. This would take those no-go zones and those marine protection areas to a whole nother level. Um, similarly yeah. with national monuments and then preparing those to become national parks, which are the most restrictive of any public lands. National parks are great, but not every public land has to be a national park. I think that's where a lot of people miss it. But there are different attacks very overtly and very covertly that are coming in the form of these rule changes or these initiatives. But this Forest Service rule, like we have been talking about, it would lead to incremental changes. You'll lose that access and you'll never be able to get it back. Well, that's, and that's the goal, right? So how do we limit participation if we can't mm -hmm. enact gun, anti-gun legislation well, we can limit access and therefore drop participation. We'll take away where they can exactly. actually participate in shooting sports. And then, you know, essentially we drop participation that way. So completely <laughs> underhanded uh, backdoor way to the do one it. Point. They love to top the $1.6 billion generated from shooters, hunters, and anglers. They, they're they like, oh, it's tied to the bipartisan infrastructure bill and this. I'm like, these have nothing to do with your crazy tax and spend bills. Mm -hmm. Don't Don't pervert. Pittman Robertson or Dingle Johnson with these monstrosities of bills, which will have nothing to bolster. Like we talked about, we we want piecemeal bills. We don't want these gargantuan bills that have nothing to do with conservation, diluting the purpose of these two very seminal laws. No. And they continue to love this. So what happens when you enact gun control of these prohibitions? You're going to see a diminishment of these funds. And then you won't have you know so much to, to brag about. But they love to ride the coattails of sportsmen, all the while backstab them with these covert prohibitions and, and restrictions to access. And if people don't see this now, I don't know when they will. And I know you have been doing a good job trying to educate your listeners. I've been trying to educate my listeners and social media followers about this, not because, you know, I'm a Republican and a conservative and I oppose everything, you know, vehemently about Biden. I personally yeah. do not like and support their agenda, but I can come about it objectively independent of my, you know, opposition to them and say like, well, it, you're more professional than me because I don't ever hear you calling President dumbass, but... Uh. <laughs> I'm not going to, to resort to name calling. You're, you're more at liberty to do that. But for me, you know, I try to be objective about it. I, everyone has their biases. I'm open about my biases. Well, that's why they'll invite you on Fox and they were, they were like, no, we can't have that <laughs> the Texas guy. No, 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 no. But the thing <laughs> is, like, I'm even with my biases and my opposition to their policies, I'm reading straight from their proposed rule. It right. states very clearly what they want to do. You don't have to be a Republican. You don't have to be a Democrat to see point blank what exactly they're doing. If it says closure, justification for it, you have to take them at face value. And, and I see repeated trends of this. We, we've talked about this at length on the Safari Club podcast here on your podcast. You've come on mine. There's a trend going on. And this is very troubling because everyone's like, well, no, hunting is not under attack. And eh, you, you crazy white ring extremists. And here I can riff on it more openly, you know, than I do on some other well, platforms. Someone just pull up the Sportsman's Alliance uh, Instagram page and you will see all it is is just updates where hunting is under attack on a yes. state level or federally. And it's, and it's not, not a partisan bent. It's not a partisan lens either. Sportsman's Alliance is a nonprofit. They specifically show and you can identify what states these are. Blue states. Mm -hmm. What are they doing? They are promoting and passing prohibitions on hunting and even fishing. Um, red states are not doing so. Uh, there They're are bills. The opposite. See Florida. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And we could talk about that a little later. 
Yeah. Um, and, that, and you can see at the federal level who is in charge, who controls the chambers, who controls the White House. And unfortunately, it has to be viewed in a partisan prism. Um, but it, again, conservation shouldn't be partisan, but it's being made out to be partisan by people, especially on the left. Um, and a lot of people in the middle don't see that yet. I hope they do. Yeah. Um, and they're and and we've criticized what about the even... hunters that voted for Biden. They have to be <laughs> thinking, wow. Um, hmm. Well, I didn't they don't like see Trump the personal impact. He though. was kind of a arrogant jerk, but uh, you know, Biden's going to be a friend of sport. No, we yeah. gained access under Trump, and we have mm -hmm. only lost yep. under Biden. He is not a friend of ours. Anyone that's a sportsman and says, "Oh, I'm voting Democrat," I get your head out of your ass. What are you doing? Either you think either you're just kind of a fringe sportsman and this other stuff matters way more to you. But if you actually are voting because you think the left is more friendly to hunting and shooting, you are living in la la land people. Unfortunately. Yeah. I think some of our friends in the middle who want to give deference to this administration, they think because it doesn't personally affect them, it's not happening. We've mm -hmm. seen this in Montana, you know, when it had Steve Bullock previously before Jan Forte came to office, a lot of, you know, middle of the road sportsmen were kind of dismissive. Oh, Democrats are not attacking this. And then they see federally what's happening and they're like, whoa, I didn't know this is happening. And certainly, you know, every and, and some of the people, some of these folks will say, well, Republicans have attacked hunting. There have been instances and, and we've called them out for it. The Return Act is a horrible piece of legislation. Mm -hmm. It would completely upend and undercut conservation funding. But that's only one instance. It's not, it's not, you know, saying that they can't, you know, potentially propose other bad legislation. But that's the only and conservative piece of sportsman. You know, we were very outspoken when mm -hmm. Representative Clyde introduced that. And I like, yeah. you know, his take on the Second Amendment. I don't agree with him or Ted Cruz or Mike Lee on their take on private lands. Uh, I mean, on public lands, like they're important to me, which is going back to this. A lot of people that say they're sportsmen, sportsmen and voted left did it because they love public land. But this, these people are closing public land access that you voted exactly. for. Yeah, so. Exactly. Yeah. It, it, and like I said, it's going to come with more national monument designations. I don't know. Have you researched into the El Paso opening? It's not as many acres as the one in Nevada, but the Nevada one, I worry since it's over half a million acres, that could potentially lead to some closures because those designations mm -hmm. often don't allow for scientific inquiry as it comes through wildlife management. So there have been historical incidences in Arizona, Utah, and other states where these national monument expansions often don't account for hunting and fishing, and like they often exclude claw. this activity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Bears Ears has done that a Bear, lot too. Bears Ears. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, no, we can be nuanced in terms of like you know who has done egregious stuff on public lands, but the the totality, the millions of acres that we're seeing potentially closed under this administration has me very worried. Um, regardless of my being a conservative, if I'm a public lands advocate, I'd be extremely worried about all the attacks from different cylinders coming uh, from this administration, from this Department of Interior. And, you know, it, it really is concerning. I think you have to look at it that way. Yeah. Um, well, SCI put it to Deb Howland when she was nominated by Biden. Are yes. you for, um, what was it? Uh, no Protecting net loss. Protecting no net loss, yeah. Yeah, no net loss. And she wouldn't answer. And here we go, because clearly that wasn't her agenda. Preservation is not conservation. Um, you mentioned incremental bans. So you grew up in California. Um, you know, they banned mountain lion hunting in the 90s. Mm -hmm. When I first started the show 2009, it was like maybe 2010, I got wind of they were trying to ban uh, black bear and bobcat hunting with hounds. So give them a year, they banned that. Okay. Now, in I think it was 2020, they banned bobcat hunting completely so you couldn't do it with hounds in 2013 or 2012 whenever it was they banned it uh and then now you can't even hunt bobcats they're a protected animal a bobcat like they're vermin in where i live we have them in the neighborhood they're cool to see i i like bobcats right but we just treat them like uh any other non-game animal like yeah, there's so many of them they can th just like coyotes thrive in any environment all over north america and we have to treat them like they belong on the endangered species list. Like it's, a, it's a joke, but that's it's incrementally, absurd. you can just see nineties mm -hmm. mountain lions. Then we take hound hunting and then we just say, Nope, can't kill a bobcat. Okay. Yeah. That's what that, what, excuse me. That's what's at stake here. And I want to point to your listeners too, and, and we can even do future episodes on this, but there are efforts to remake wildlife agencies to divorce hunters from critical conservation decisions. We're seeing this in California. We've seen this in Washington state with the black bear hunt. Mm -hmm. We saw this in New Jersey, but New Jersey 
miraculously was able to restore their black bear hunt and the governor who campaigned on this very issue i haven't seen that before yeah. it was um, because of the he was forced to have to retract bear conflict like they needed to take some bears <laughs> yes and uh, yeah, he was forced to have to reignite and, and restart the season because it just got so bad with all human bear conflicts. And it really hurts the bears at most, you know, human bear conflicts are terrible and, and we all want to mitigate those, but people forget that wild animals are very, you know, aggressive towards each other. And so it would decimate even those wild populations too. But a group that we all have to be worried about is called wildlife for all. And they're out of New Mexico and mm -hmm. they're very aligned with, you know, the Sierra clubs, the NRDCs, the CBDs all these groups and they're going to start to gain traction and they have been given legitimacy at it was a wildlife management institute conference i forget exactly what it was but um andrew mckean had written about this how they were given acceptance at one of the wildlife conferences recently they sponsored a happy hour a panel and giving legitimacy to these groups would completely undermine conservation um we can work with people maybe sometimes we can work with like the nature conservancy and a handful of others who want to actually promote stewardship Right. There are some opportunities, you know, through those kind of established groups, but virulently anti-hunting groups, no, we should not mm -hmm. be working with them because they have a stated purpose to make and remake wildlife agencies. You're letting the fox work. into the hen house. Is exactly. What you're doing. And, exactly. Uh, and, and I, and I want to uh, expand on that and, go, you know, kind of go back to the Bobcat thing. Why I've been so adamantly opposed to Texans from outlines is because mm -hmm. here we want to implement mandatory harvest we want to do away with uh you know x kind of traps you know uh okay what what is their end goal it's the same thing as what you would have what you've seen in california they exist texans for mountain lions ultimately nothing would make them happier than to have mountain lions protected in texas mm -hmm. that is the end game you can it's when you have people on your board that have financed um a smut attack job basically on predator hunting on on coyote hunting in in the form of pam hart like she paid for that film and it's called it's for project coyote and she's on the board and you don't think that her in game is to ban mountain lion? these people are you've lost your minds if you don't if you can't connect the dots that ultimately they would have the biggest party in the world if they could say we got we got mountain lions protected in texas that's their goal right and what's to stop them from prohibiting bear hunting we already see those efforts then they're going to say you know what why don't we protect elk mm -hmm. why don't we protect deer Oh, maybe even duck hunting. How dare they kill ducks? We see this oh, in Australia. Well, we would have protected elk, but the wolves ate them all. So <laughs> <laughs> we can't do that. Um, so here, here's something interesting I want to read to you. And this was sent to me by a follower who's a grad student at uh, Virginia Tech pursuing a degree oh, in wildlife nice. management because it's the, uh, the wildlife for all mentality. And so he says, I'm DMing you again to follow up on the post I reacted to a couple of years ago. I transferred to a university. I'm going to graduate in a couple of weeks with a wildlife conservation degree. Yesterday, the department head spoke to my senior class, among other things, told us that many wildlife agencies are strongly leaning away from the North American model of wildlife conservation, citing that it is not inclusive enough. See that word inclusive? We see that a lot. In Did he societal. say the Virginia department head said this? Well, I didn't say Virginia, but you're connecting oh. the dots. Oh, I don't know. It's, it's Virginia because... Tech. It's Virginia Tech. Um, so he said, citing that it's not inclusive enough and has a game species focus. This was very concerning for wildlife as a whole and also for the future of hunting. That was the student's opinion. Mm -hmm. uh, his department had said that many state fish and wildlife agencies have been meeting to potentially shift their focus to a one health approach, which with a Google search is an idea proposed by the CDC and WHO, the WHO. <laughs> not trying to be a conspiracy theorist, but it might be an interesting subject to look into for your show. So I have emailed that department head and asked to have an Ryan? interview with him. Ryan uh, is the director. If he said that, that, that astounds me. Um, I don't know him personally, but I have. Maybe his name's not Ryan. Him. He sent me uh, the, uh, the guy's snodgrass is his last name let me okay tell you. that's not that's not the, the the actual department head would definitely not support that but if it says okay. snodgrass i've heard that name teased before but if it's if it's a deputy he's saying that Joel he's going against snodgrass, the department professor and department head of uh Tech. Oh, i thought you meant the agency if it no, was no 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 sorry no this is just his this is the department head of his of Vir oh, virginia oh, oh. 
of Virginia Tech Fish and Mixed Wildlife. The, okay, okay. Yes. Not the Virginia Department of um, Wildlife Resources. No, no, no. Because no, no, Ryan, no. Yeah. yeah, our our agency is great. No, they will never support redoing it. Okay. So the Virginia yeah. Tech Natural Resources Department is pushing this. That's scary. Mm -hmm. That's yeah, very but scary. I, but I feel like this is not going to be unique to Virginia Tech. If they're no. doing it, it's going to be in the university system as right. they're trying to shift this mentality mm -hmm. away from hunters and on, you know, but again, going back to what we already discussed. Okay. Well, the elephant in the room is who's funding it now. Mm -hmm. what, these anti-hunting groups are just going to pony up billions, hundreds of million dollars a year to support wildlife conservation. No, they're not going to do that. Right. We all know that. So the wildlife loses because there's now no funding to support the wildlife. They don't have a value anymore. So like, it's a nice idea. We could, it's a fairy tale is what it is. <laughs> it really is. Like we can just manage all this stuff, but we don't have any money to manage it. So then it just is left to its own devices. Crazy sidebar. If the listener wants to connect with me, that I, that actually may be worth exploring. If he has documentation, I'll write about it because it is mm -hmm. my state. And I have actually a friend who's a graduate of the, the school too. And I think she would not be pleased to hear one of the professors say that. So sidebar, connect me to the person if they're interested. Um, yeah. I would love to explore that with them because you would get a lot of outrage, I think, from our state wildlife agency, which I um, unfortunately confused with the, 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 the university with Virginia Tech. Um, because I, like I said, want to reiterate, our state wildlife agency is great. They've worked across different administrations. They're wonderful. They understand the conservation model. But if the school is going against what the state agency and every state agency is doing, um, that's very problematic what they're teaching these kids. Yeah. Um, and, and Which those is why he reached out to me because yeah. he's not an idiot. He was like, this yeah. is not wildlife management. This is... Those are the last vestiges of teaching future conservationists. And if it, I mean, higher education is completely corrupt. If yeah. they corrupt this last entity, which has largely been unaffected by these, um, I mean, certainly they put the climate alarmism into their curriculum as well. But if they're teaching them away from the North American model, that is highly concerning. And I would absolutely love to do a piece on that and maybe do an investigation into not yeah. just Virginia Tech, but anywhere else where they're trying to do this. Well, that term that he used, which is like, if you want to talk about a term, that, and I don't get triggered, but it, it, it's a term that's alarming is when they, when someone uses the term inclusivity, you know, like. It doesn't mean inclusivity. Uh, uh yeah. Uh, but that's means... what the professor said, you know, it's not <laughs> inclusive enough. So yeah, that's a, that's a woke word. If there ever was one, um, Florida, let's, let's talk about something on positive. a high note. Let's yeah. end on a high note. Yes. And so I don't know if you have this handy, but how many States now, because Florida just did this, how many States have enacted a right to hunt and fish bill? And ultimately, what does that like, what does that do for us? Sure. On the books, there are 23 state laws. Florida, pending if it goes before the ballot, it will go on the ballot next year. And if they pass it, I don't know if they have to reach a certain threshold or if it's just a majority threshold. But if Florida passes it next year on the ballot, it'll become the 24th state. And I think there were a few other ballot initiatives deliberated in some other states. Oregon had one this year, but I don't think it advanced and was signed Shocker. into law. Um, but several others, I think um, Missouri is missing out. Like, a lot of states are missing out on it. I think Texas has it. Um, we in Virginia have it. But what this essentially does is it basically states in the state constitution that there's an essential right to hunt and fish in your state. Uh, buffering, obviously, your state wildlife agency and the stuff that they do, um, protecting wildlife, recognizing the purpose that hunters and anglers play. And I think it also acts as a conduit uh, to protect against any instances of hunter and fisher harassment. Um, you probably you're familiar with those laws. So oh, yeah. I think all that it does is to help further insulate and protect these activities from future attacks. It's kind of a preemptive protection against any attempt to erode, uh, perhaps to remake wildlife agencies that can act as a buffer against it. So let's say um, I'm trying to think of a state that could potentially flip. Let's say I don't think Georgia is going to have this problem. It's a very you know interesting situation federally with the senators, but statewide Georgia, I think, is going to go back or continue to be very Republican. But let's say a state like Georgia down the road, elects a Democrat governor. They have a right to hunt and fish amendment from my understanding. Um, and let's say a Democrat administration comes in. I think because they have that constitutional amendment in place, it prevents any kind of you know funny business from happening. I have to look at it legally if it does protect it from that, but I think it could be used and justified to say, sorry, you cannot remake the wildlife agency in this fashion, so-called inclusive, more democratic as they bill it, but it's not inclusive or democratic when you're taking away stakeholders from decision-making abilities. Mm -hmm. But I think um, I would like to see, I would wonder if this would ever be codified federally. 
I don't know if any bills such to to elevate the right to hunt and fish federally has ever been passed. Um, but it'd be interesting if someone does propose it in the future, recognizing that these attacks. Well, it won't be this administration. No, no, no. If we get a Republican <laughs> administration, maybe someone in Congress will look to be like, you know, we need extra assurances to ensure that hunting and fishing are not eroded. And then they could look to and say, well, every state has a hunter harassment or angler harassment provision stating that if you interfere with lawful taking of game or fish, you will face penalties. I wonder if that's a, a pretext that they can use to say that you need to protect it. Um, but but there, the Floridians that I spoke to, I interviewed one of the bills sponsored, Representative Lauren Mello, and two of my friends who were involved in the grassroots side of it. And they said they recognized that uh, she specifically pointed to Washington state and all these states that are New Mexico that are passing these prohibitions at the state level because there's no right to hunt and fish amendment. She said, I want to make sure that the Florida I grew up in, the Florida that allowed me to fish, to explore the outdoors, stays that way. And we need this amendment to ensure that that heritage is protected for years to come. Mm -hmm. And I think it also has to do with the state wildlife agency continuing to recognize that hunters and anglers are the primary drivers of these conservation decisions. Um, even if it's not outwardly stated like that, I think that's what you can interpret the that provision to have. But not even half the country, just under half the country has these provisions. Um, I think your listeners can, if you go to Ballotpedia, you can see which state has it, which state doesn't. Um, there's a partial one, I think, in Rhode Island and California. I think they recognize the right to fish, but not the right to hunt. And mm -hmm. more states, I think people, if they're very interested in in protecting these activities, you could look to maybe telling your local representative to pass it um, to, again, protect any future eroding of these activities. But they're good buffers. I would love to see a national one potentially deliberated. We'll see if that ever happens. But these are good measures at the state level to maybe protect against and be a bulwark against any attacks at the federal level. Mm -hmm. I think for, for legal challenges, these could be cited and used as, as a buffer to say you're eroding the hunting and fishing outdoor heritage. You can't do that citing these laws. So let's say if someone challenges the closures due to lead prohibitions or Alaska prohibitions, you know, of 60 million acres or these forest service closures, they can point to PR, Dingle Johnson and these state amendments and say, you're completely <laughs> eroding state law you're yeah. eroding, you know, these protections and, and you're going to undercut funding. You're going to undermine what's been working for almost a hundred years. So I think these could be good also for legal challenges as well. So, I, yeah. So it's something that sounds nice, right? On the surface. So we have the right to hunt fish and we should all be excited about that. But you just did a great job of explaining why they're important, really, um, other than just, you know, a nice headline. Right. Yeah. Um, so, okay. Well, cool stuff on that front. Um, I've certainly enjoyed the conversation today as always, Gabby. Always Very well rounded but... as always, yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, folks, check out Gabby's podcast, the District of Conservation podcast. Uh, she does a great job there. And it is always a pleasure to have you on, my friend. Thank you, Cable. A pleasure to join you. And let's do this again. Come back on yeah. mine too. Absolutely. We'll do it soon.